Hello everyone, um, I'm here today to give an Open Access 101, so a brief introduction to Open Access. My name's Elizabeth Knowles, I'm the Associate Editorial Director for the Medicine and Health Journals at the publisher Taylor & Francis, so working across the Taylor & Francis portfolio and more recently also on the Dove Medical Press Journals. First of all, what is Open Access? It's two things. It's making the content openly available to read so that an article can be accessed anywhere by anyone. And then it's about the reuse of that content. So it's making that content reusable by third parties with little or no restrictions on that reuse. So why is open access important? Well, between 2014 and 2015, there was a 15% growth in open access revenue, which then in 2015 was $335 million globally. But that was only 4% of the journal's market, so although this is a rapidly growing area, it's still important to point out that it's a relatively small proportion of revenues in the publishing space. Another thing that I wanted to pull out is, uh, at the time of doing this, there were 794 global open access policies, which just shows the difficult field that authors, publishers, funders are having to work with, and that there are so many policies out there that they need to navigate. Just looking at it globally, this is some information from Clarivate Analytics, Web of Science data, and it's the percentage of research published by country. And as you can see, there's a broad range here. Perhaps one of the things that you might want to pull out, maybe you would expect the USA to be higher. They haven't had the same uptake in open access as we have seen perhaps in mainland Europe, um, where open access has, has moved further on and there's a bigger uptake by authors. So what are the pros and cons of open access? Well, there's the potential for greater reach and impact of the research that's been published and greater discoverability of that work. This can then in turn potentially lead to higher usage and citations of that content. It does allow the authors to retain their copyright and they can post their version of record where they like. From a publisher and an editor point of view, there's also fewer restrictions or economic restrictions on the amount that can be published that does exist in a subscription print title. On the negative side, there can be more admin associated with publishing open access. The cost is now at the author's door because they need to pay an article publishing charge. Compliance with all the funder requirements, I mentioned all the different OA policies just now. The different licensing and navigating um, the differences in that and knowing what's going on with your paper. And also a lack of funding. The funding available can really differ by the subject area that you're working in or where you're based or by geography. So what are the different publishing models? Now I'm going to touch on gold open access in my presentation and green open access. So gold open access can be split into two areas. It's either a fully open access journal, which at Taylor & Francis is our Taylor & Francis open portfolio, or it's a hybrid journal. This is where uh, an article is published open access in what is otherwise a subscription title. And at Taylor & Francis, that's our open select portfolio. I'm briefly going to discuss the Taylor & Francis pricing policy for our hybrid journals, but other publishers will have similar programs in place. So when a peer review article is accepted by a Taylor & Francis hybrid journal, the author, the institution, the funder will have the opportunity to make that article open access if they want to, um, usually following the payment of an article publishing charge. These artic open access articles are published in addition to the subscription content that was already planned for that volume. This policy means that subscribers pay on the basis of the subscription content and any additional open access content is then extra content that's being published in the journal. This means that you are not paying subscription payments and an article publishing charge for the same paper. So now I'm going to look at gold versus green and some of the different options that are available. So what is gold open access? This means that the final version of an article, which is commonly referred to as the version of record, is permanently and freely available online for anyone, anywhere to read. There are a few or sometimes no restrictions on how people can reuse the work, but they usually have to credit the author to do so. The authors get to retain their copyright 
and they usually have to pay an article publishing charge to make the article available via gold open access. So this is a different model from the subscription side of it because now you have the author paying the article publishing charge so that the reader can access the content for free. So what have been about the reuse of that content? In a traditional subscription model, the authors transfer the copyright to the publisher and then the publisher can license out that material to third parties to reuse it. But in open access publishing, the author has retained the copyright. They have granted a non-exclusive license to the journal to publish that work. And the authors can choose which license that they want to publish that work under. And there are various different Creative Commons licenses, which I'm going to go through in a minute. The license they choose then defines how third parties can reuse that content. Something that I want to highlight here that is different is free access and shouldn't be confused with open access. So free access is usually in a subscription title where the paper has been bought in front of the paywall and it's usually for a limited time period but it's important to note that that article still adheres to the copyright guidelines of the subscription content in the journal. It is not published under a Creative Commons license and cannot necessarily be reused. So it's important to check the license information for that article. Occasionally you might see free access referred to as bronze access. So here are all the different licenses that I'm going to run through. The base license is a CCBY license. And this allows others to distribute, remix, tweak, build upon the work, even commercially, as long as they credit the original creation. Each then element, as we go across, adds uh, a level of restriction. So the next one across is an NC, a non-commercial license, which means the content cannot be reused for commercial purposes. The next one is ND, non-derivative. So others cannot amend your work. So they can take the whole article and they can reuse the whole article, but they cannot take a figure out of it and reuse it elsewhere. That can be popular if there's concerns about possible misrepresentation or misinterpretation of the uh, contents of an article. And then there's share alike. That means that any new creations or modifications of the work have to be published under the same license as the original creation. Now, at Taylor & Francis, the license we used is defined at the journal level. So you can go to our Taylor & Francis Open Access Journal Finder tool and see what licenses are available for each journal. We offer all of these options apart from Share Alike. We don't use the Share Alike license on any of our journals at the moment. So then looking at Green Open Access. This is usually associated with subscriptions publishing and subscription journals. And it's the deposit of the article in a repository, often after an embargo period, and it's usually an earlier version of the article. So this can then sit alongside the version of record which is published in the journal. At Taylor & Francis, we do not have an embargo on authors using their original manuscript and posting it somewhere. So the original manuscript is the one that you have submitted to the journal before peer review. And we also don't have an embargo on posting the accepted manuscript to personal sites such as Facebook. Um, the accepted manuscript is the one that's been through peer review, but before it's been copy edited and typeset. We do, however, have a 12-month embargo period if authors want to post to a repository or an academic social network. We do also work with some funders, such as the NIH, and we will deposit papers on their behalf um, into PubMed. And we've done a little bit of research when we're looking at author deposits, and actually we've seen a very low uptake. So when we did some research, less than 2% of authors were submitting their papers to repositories. We think this could be due to perhaps the differing availability of repositories to authors, their lower discoverability, and the fact that people still feel that researchers need to have access to the version of record. But this is something that we're keeping an eye on to see if this changes. So we've said that open access is growing, um, albeit it's still a smaller part of our publishing output, but how are we dealing with that transition? Um, we're piloting a few models. So we have a few transformational agreements in place. Um, one I want to highlight is our agreement with the VSNU, which is the Association of Universities in the Netherlands. So from 2016, any corresponding author from a VSNU institution is automatically, their article is automatically made open access when it's published in one of our hybrid journals. 
we have regional agreements. So we have an agreement with the GIST Consortium in the UK and it entitles them to discounted um, APC rates on our journals. And then we have institutional memberships. So an individual library may have a prepay um, plan set up with us that allows their users to then publish open access in our journals. And they can use our researcher dashboard to see how many articles are going through and where the content is being published and how their members are using um, that fund. Something that often comes up when we're talking about open access is publishing ethics. There are publishers and journals who exploit authors. Um, it has been referred to as predatory publishers, but that is a debated term. All of our open access journals are peer reviewed. And even if you're considering submitting to something that would be considered perhaps a mega journal, there's still a requirement for a soundness of methodology. You may not require the novelty or uh, uniqueness that a subscription title may have requested in the past, but it still has to pass peer review and it still has to be a soundness methodology of the work that's being published. If you're ever not sure about a journal or a publisher, then I'd encourage you to go to the Think, Check, Submit criteria, which is online, before submitting your paper. Somewhere else that you can also look is the DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals. Actually now, many funders are mandating that a journal needs to be indexed by the DOAJ for the author to receive their funding for the APC. Another place that you can look for for a sign of integrity is OASPA, the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, of which Taylor & Francis is a member and a lot of the other large publishers will also be. The last thing that I just wanted to touch on was open data. From 2018, Taylor & Francis have introduced our policy on data sharing. Uh, which applies to many of our journals, and we're encouraging authors to deposit in a suitable repository to cite the data and then to include a data availability statement so that others can access that data. Why share data? Some funders are actually now making it a requirement that you have to um, share your data, but there are also several benefits. Sharing the data publicly improves the robustness of the research uh, process, so it allows validation, and others to try and replicate results, which can in turn lead to advances in discovery and knowledge. There's also then greater opportunity for other research to be carried out with that data, such as meta-analyses. If you deposit your data in a repository, then you can create a permanent identifier, such as a DOI, which then allows authors to cite that data set, and the researchers can then get the appropriate credit for their work. It also acts as a preservation tool, so the long-term preservation of that data. Finally, wider public availability of the research data supports the translation of that research, hopefully, into clinical practice. Thank you for your time today, and if anyone wants to contact me um, with any questions, then please feel free to reach out.